Hey everyone, CJ here. Welcome to the second episode of the Water Margin Summarized series. In the previous episode, we covered the release of the 108 demons, the rise of the main antagonist, Gao and the appearance of our first major character, Si Jing. This time, we are going to turn the spotlight onto the next major character, the flowery monk Lu Zisen and panzer head Lin Chong. For historical and cultural context, I will also talk about what was considered worse than eating dog meat in Song Dynasty and how criminal punishments work in the era. Before I start, take a look at these cool shirts and merch for the series. I have added a black colored variation to the shirt and merch just as requested by everyone. Creating this series takes a lot of resources and labor, so our team would really appreciate it if you show us some support by getting these cool shirts from the link below. Alternatively, you can also support us on Patreon or make one of donation by using the Super Thanks button or coffee. Come on, drink! Ha ha ha! Lu Zisen is one of those novel characters who speaks with the caps lock on at all time. He is not afraid to say and do whatever was on his mind. Who the heck is wailing out there? I'm trying to drink here! The mournful ballad of a singer and her elderly father disturbed Lu Zisen and his drinking companions. After talking to them for a bit, they learned about the woman's past. She was coerced to be the concubine of a rich and powerful butcher, Zheng, for a sum of money. Then, when his wife found out, she was thrown out of their home and was even forced to pay the money back. Oh, that's outrageous! How dare he bully good people like you! Lu Zisen was incensed by this injustice. Inside the man's rough exterior is a heart of gold. He was the quintessential shonen manga hero type, albeit middle-aged. He is perhaps also the few objectively good people among the 108 stars, while the others are in different shades of moral grey. So he pulled up some money between his drinking companions and himself, and gave it to the father and daughter. He wasn't impressed by Li Zong's miserly offering though. On the next day, after delivering the father and daughter out of town safely by fending off Zheng's goons, Lu Zisen paid the butcher a visit. He stirred up trouble by ordering difficult cuts of meat. And just to let you know, back then, before plastic shopping bags were invented, they used to wrap meat with lotus leaves. Uh, my dear customer, is this some sort of a joke? Yeah, it is! Lu Zisen threw the package at him and a fight ensued. Whoops! Lu Zisen didn't expect that the big guy would be killed by just three punches. Well, looks like it is time to go AWOL. So Lu Zisen spent the next half month wandering aimlessly, escaping the pursuit of the authorities. Until one day, he came to the district of Taizhou. Over there, he was surprised to chance upon the father and daughter again. Apparently, she had remarried and her new rich and influential husband was grateful to Lu Zisen for his past assistance. So he gave his wife's benefactor a monk certificate and used his influence to find him a place of refuge in a nearby temple on Mount Wutai. During the Song Dynasty, monks need certificates to prove their identity because they are exempt from tax and coffee labor. Some rich people could just buy a certificate and enter any monastery. Lu Zisen was obviously not a monk material, but since the new husband was a generous patron of the temple, the monks were conflicted by the request. The abbot, however, saw great potential in him. He predicted that one day Lu Zisen will achieve great enlightenment, and he welcomed him into the monastery. Hey, 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 do you mind leaving some of my beard on? Wait, wait, wait! Among their many restrictions, a Buddhist monk is supposed to refrain from drinking alcohol and eating meat. Obviously, these are not the type of rules Lu Zisen can or will follow. It didn't take long until he started sneaking off to buy them. Among the meat he ate was dog meat, which was relatively common in ancient China and is still eaten in some parts of China today. But dog meat was not the most desirable meat. Pork was the most common type of meat and mutton was the most expensive and sought after meat. During the Northern Song period, the imperial kitchen even used mutton exclusively. In many Western cultures, 
the consumption of dog meat is often seen to be disgusting since dogs were considered as humans' best friend. But historically, in Song Dynasty, the worst meats you can have were beef and horse meat. The slaughter of cattle and horses were criminalized because these animals support agricultural work as draft animals. And agricultural work had always been highly respected in ancient China. Additionally, agriculture was an important source of national wealth. So the slaughter of cows and the consumption of beef, which Lu Zisen and the other outlaws also indulged in, was seen as an act of rebellion against the empire. Today in China, there are no restrictions against beef consumption. As a quick tangent, interestingly, beef is banned in most Indian states today because cows are considered to be sacred animals in Hinduism. And if you go to Indian McDonald's, you won't find beef burger anywhere. I just think that it is kind of interesting to see how different cultures have different meat consumption taboos and how it could change through time. Anyway, besides breaking temple rules, Lu Zisen also got into fights with a whole horde of other monks in the temple. After these misadventures, not even the abbot could keep him around anymore. So they eventually transferred him to another temple in the capital. Along his travel, he had a couple of mini adventures, side quests. In the first one, he swatted a bandit chief from forcibly marrying a girl by pretending to be the victim. After he was beaten, the bandit called upon his powerful big bro to deal with him. But the big bro turned out to be Li Zhong. Knowing that they're obviously outclassed, they listened to whatever Lu Zisen said and called off the wedding. The younger bandit was called Zhou Tong, the little conqueror. He will one day join the band of outlaws too. Next, he came upon a temple held hostage by a pair of villainous Buddhist and Taoist monks. Since he was hungry and outnumbered at the time, Lu Zisen was beaten back and forced to retreat. Luckily for him, he chanced upon his old friend, Si Jing, who was just wandering around. So after eating whatever supplies Si Jing had, the two of them returned to the temple and defeated the villainous pair. Just to remind you that this is a grim dark novel, they discovered that the hostages had committed suicide because they thought that nobody would ever save them. As the two friends were saying their goodbyes, Si Jing told Lu Zisen that after failing to find his master and unable to support himself, he decided to join Zhu Wu and the other bandits. Finally, when Lu Zisen arrived at the new temple in the capital, he was assigned to oversee a vegetable garden which was occupied by a group of pilfering miscreants. They tried to play a prank on him by pushing him into a cesspit, but Lu Zisen reacted quickly and they are the ones who were kicked into the cesspit themselves. After showing them who's the boss, they quickly became his lackeys. On the next day, his new followers pulled whatever little money they had and threw him a feast with plenty of wine. Life here is looking pretty good for Lu Zisen. And that's why we're going to turn our spotlight to a new character soon. Ha <laughs> ha Hey, stop squawking, you annoying crow! Why I order? <laughs> the drunk Lu Zisen casually displayed his strength by uprooting a tree with his bare hands. <laughs> you think that's cool? I'll show you what's cool. Lu Zisen then started swinging his custom-made pole arm and showed that he had excellent martial arts skill too. Good show! Amazing skill you have there! The voice interrupted Lu Zisen and he turned towards the source. Apparently, the voice belonged to a dashing officer with panther-like features. He was of course Panzerhead Ling Tong, the pole arm instructor of the Imperial Army. The two hit it off really well and immediately became sworn brothers, with Lu Zisen being the elder brother. This instant rapport and sweating of brotherhood is a pretty common trope in Chinese literature actually. In real life, it usually takes a lot longer. It may even take years of great friendship for people to become sworn siblings. Although it has become quite rare in this modern age. Unfortunately, before they could enjoy more of this sworn brotherhood, trouble soon found them. Ling Chong's mate rushed to report that his wife was being harassed by a man in the temple she was worshipping in. When Ling Chong rushed to the scene, he was surprised to discover that the pervert was Ko Ya Ne, the adopted son of Grand Marshal Ko Chiu, 
not wanting to make enemy of the Grand Marshal, he let Gao Junior go, unharmed. The young man, however, just can't get Ling Chong's beautiful wife out of his mind. So he schemed with Ling Chong's own treacherous old friend, Lu Qian, to isolate her in a secluded place where he could have his ways with her. Fortunately, that plan was foiled again by Ling Chong's trusty mate, who alerted him in the nick of time. Depressed by his repeated failures and pining, Gao Jr. became weak and sickly. In order to lift his spirit, his lackeys cooked up another scheme. And this time, Grand Marshal Gao Chou himself was part of the plan. Oh wow, what a bargain! On one lucky day, Ling Chong bought an especially rare and precious sword that was sold at a bargain price. And as soon as he got home, he received news that the Grand Marshal, Gao Chiu, wanted to have a look at this precious sword he had just bought. That is odd. Why is he being so nosy? Ling Chong thought. When he went to Gao Chiu's place of residence, he was then led deep into the inner halls of the building by an attendant he had never seen before. Then, he suddenly realized that he had been brought into a restricted military council chamber while carrying his weapon. You! What are you doing in this restricted hall? Are you trying to assassinate me? Guards! Seize him! Ling Chong fell squarely into this trap. Obviously, attempting to assassinate a high-ranking official is a serious crime. It could be considered as one of the 10 abominations, 10 of the worst crimes according to traditional Chinese law. Here is a quick crash course on imperial Chinese laws. When found guilty, Ling Chong would be punished according to the Five Punishments. During this period, Punishments 3, 4, 5 were often converted to military servitude. If he was the emperor's relative or other exceptional individual, he would get reduced sentences according to the Eight Deliberations Rule. But unfortunately, the rule does not apply to cases involving the Ten Abominations. Thus, Ling Chong was beaten 20 times with heavy cane and exiled to an army post in Changzhou. Additionally, he was given criminal tattoo on the face. In Song Dynasty, there were up to 200 crimes that involved tattooing and banishment to join the army. In Song Dynasty, these tattoos were euphemistically called Golden Seal. Korea, Vietnam, and Japan also had similar laws since their laws were also inspired by the Tang Dynasty Code. That is also why the tattoos are traditionally connected to criminality in East Asia. Not knowing when he would be able to return, Ling Chong granted his wife a divorce by signing the divorce papers so that she could find a better husband. But his troubles weren't over yet because the two guards who were tasked to transfer him were also secretly ordered to kill him. Oh no you don't! Luckily, Lu Zhisen saved him in the nick of time. Hoping that one day he would be allowed to return to society, Ling Chong pleaded for their lives. Reluctantly, Lu Zhisen spared them. But he had to follow and watch them, and he did it for days until they were close to their destination before leaving. Now, just before he reached his destination, Ling Chong heard about the philanthropist who receives criminals and those in need. So he decided to pay him a visit. Obviously, the guards are in no position to object, since that episode with Lu Zhisen. So he went to the philanthropist's home and he met Cai Jing, another star of destiny. He admired Ling Chong's martial arts skill as the former pole arm instructor of the Imperial Army. But there was coincidentally another martial arts instructor there named Hong who wasn't too impressed by him. So predictably, the two had to spar. Now, this section in chapter 9 is a masterclass in wuxia writing. Here we also see many elements of the wuxia fight that we still see today. Number 1. Stance names Ling Chong put up the Shandong defense. Hong, on the other hand, used Hebei pincers to attack and pressure his opponent. Not wanting to embarrass Hong, who was Cai Jing's guest, and having the disadvantage of a kang around his neck, Ling Chong conceded the fight after a short bout. 2. Rising tension and stakes Wanting to see more of this fight, Cai Jing bribed the guards to unlock the Kang, quite literally releasing Ling Chong's power limiter. He also promised a hefty reward of silver to the winner, signaling that he wanted Ling Chong to win after all. 3. Name Moves 
As they resumed the fight, Hong used putting heaven to the torch, and Ling Chong countered with combing grass for snakes. Moving back a bit, Ling Chong exposed a weakness in his opponent's stance, and with a cracking sweep, he smashed Instructor Hong in the shin and promptly ended the fight. This is why this novel from half a millennium ago is considered to be the granddaddy of wuxia literature. But it is really a multi-genre novel, because not all fights were described with so much details. But in this case, it is relevant to exhibit Ling Chong's character. After a few days of celebration, Ling Chong reported to Changzhou Prison Barracks. He was treated well and assigned a cushy job with a lot of freedoms, because he's got Ta Jing's letter of recommendation and also enough money to bribe the wardens. After a while, he heard rumors about Lu Qian and Ko Junior's men being seen in the vicinity. This news was followed by his sudden transfer to a rundown granary depot. The roof of the shack collapsed under the weight of snow on his first day, so he had to spend the night in an old temple, which turned out to be a blessing in disguise. Later, in the middle of the night, he saw that fire had broken out in the granary, and there, standing before the flames, were the warden, Ko Jr.'s lackey, Fu An, and his treacherous former friend, Lu Qian. They were there to finish the job they had started. Even if Ling Chong escaped the fire, he would be executed for the destruction of the granary, they laughed. This was it. The straws that broke the camel's back. Now he can't return to good society anymore. So he turned full outlaw. You scum! He rushed in to skewer the warden, followed by Fu An. And for his treacherous old friend, he had reserved something special for him. Ling Chung pulled out a dagger, cut open the villain, and with his bare hands, he ripped out the man's heart and liver. Yep, this novel is that gory. Since he can't go back to the barracks anymore, Ling Chung wandered off into the snowy night. Eventually, he found shelter in an old farmer's house, and belligerently, he drove away the occupants for refusing to sell him wine. On the next morning, he discovered himself all tied up when he came to his senses. Apparently, they had discovered him lying on the snow dead drunk yesterday. Yeah, Lin Chong was still pretty new at being this big bad outlaw thing. After he was smacked around for a bit, Cha Jing arrived to the scene. Apparently, the peasants were his men. After hearing what happened to Lin Chong, he gave him a letter of recommendation and directed him to Mount Liang, where he could find refuge. Not long after, Lin Chong reached the marshes of Mount Liang and met Zhu Gui, the dry land alligator, who ferried him across to see their leader. On the next episode, we will meet the present and future leader of Mount Yang, and I will also talk about women, marriage, and divorce laws in Song Dynasty. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss it. Also, remember that we've got great t-shirt and merch you can buy to support the channel. Before I go, I would also like to thank our patrons at Patreon and other contributors for making this series possible. Until next time, stay cool, my bros!